Hello and welcome. Um, I'm Charlotte Parkin and I serve as the Director for Research and Partnerships of the London Global Gateway. Um, it is an absolute pleasure to welcome you to the first London Research Seminar for our, our spring 2022. Um, so for those who may be new to Notre Dame, uh, we're a large Catholic research university, which highly values undergraduate teaching, among other things. But we are global in scope with many gateways and centres throughout the world, um, the largest of which is our London Gateway, which is hosting the seminar today. The seminars are a wonderful opportunity for us to showcase the rich variety of research talent that we have working at the Gateway and beyond. So it's my pleasure to have, have the seminar on today. Now, before we get underway, I want to do a little bit of housekeeping. Um, you are welcome to keep your videos on throughout the seminar and we actively encourage you to use the chat window to submit your questions, it's below. Um, later in the programme, we'll have a Q&A segment, and this will be where we can address as many questions as possible. Um, please do not hesitate to submit them as they occur to you throughout our time. We'll keep, we'll keep a note of them. Now, without further ado, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce you to tonight's first speaker, Dr. Trish Bregra. Trish Bregra is a um, postdoctoral teaching scholar at the University of Notre Dame and an Institute of English Studies Early Career Research Fellow with the University of London School of Advanced Studies. She received her PhD in English um, with a specialization in, English, in British literature of the long 19th century and a graduate minor in gender studies from the University of Notre Dame in 2021. Her doctoral thesis focused on the representations of walking women in 19th century novels and life writing. She is currently with us working at the Gateway uh, with the newly acquired G.K. Chesterton collection and is conducting preliminary research on a new project examining representations of homelessness in Victorian literature. Trish's, Trish's seminar is going to offer us an inside perspective to the London Global Gateway's recently acquired G.K. Chesterton collection, and it will discuss the process of exploring and describing an archival collection while tracing its connections across Note James Chesterton related holdings in both London and back on campus in South Bend. So it's my pleasure to hand over to Trish. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Charlotte, um, for that introduction. And I'm going to do the screen sharing thing. So give me just a second here. And okay, all good. Great. So, uh, as Charlotte said, uh, today I'm going to talk about my current work as a Chester Tim postdoctoral fellow at Notre Dame. So, I'm calling my talk today um, Into the Archive with GK Chesterton. And um, just as kind of a brief overview of what I'm planning to talk about today. So, I'm going to start with just a kind of um, broader overview of some intersecting questions that kind of connect my doctoral research as well as my teaching here in London this semester with the work I'm doing with the Chesterton Collection. And then from there, I'll kind of move into a discussion of um, the more specific work that I'm doing with the archives, um, both on Notre Dame's home campus in South Bend, as well as here in London. Um, focusing first on kind of some interesting parallels between the two collections um, and sort of the overall shape of these collections, and then honing in on a few handwritten texts and sketches just to discuss some possibilities for what these collections might reveal um, for, for researchers or fans um, of, of Chesterton and of other sort of um, topics uh, uh, that people might explore through this collection. So um, as I said, before digging into the particulars of my current work, I just want to set the stage a little bit by um, discussing a few guiding questions that I found um, that actually connect sort of what I was doing for my doctoral research, right, which is the 19th century British literature, um, as well as the course that I've developed this uh, semester in London, and then the actual archival work. So as I mentioned previously, my doctoral work, or really as Charlotte mentioned previously, uh, my doctoral work focused on representations of physical mobility in 19th century British literature. So essentially I was interested in how textual representations of physical movement 
both inscribe and determine the cultural meanings that we attach to how people move through the world. And in particular, I was interested in um, gender and the role of walking in women's everyday lives and literary productions. So part of my work, particularly the sort of everyday lives component of that, um, involved some fairly substantial archival research on 19th century women's manuscript diaries, where I was really trying to access at kind of a granular level um, the factors that sort of enabled and constricted women's freedom of movement during that era. So this work took me to um, some major repositories, such as the British Library or the Bodleian, um, but also to quite a few provincial archives um, in Gloucestershire, Wigan, Halifax, and Leeds. And as I explored these kind of <laughs> literal stacks of diaries that would come out um, on cards, I became really interested in how certain archival materials come to be collected and preserved and accessed um, by, re by researchers and by members of the public. And in my case, I was particularly interested in looking at non-famous or quote unquote ordinary women um, whose diaries mostly came to be preserved through donations of family records um, to these provincial archives. And of course, they tended to belong to women um, who had sufficient money and leisure and education to keep a diary, uh, but also had enough kind of social standing for the family papers to be considered worth preserving, right? And so they're sort of uh, donated or acquired by a repository. So that's where sort of some of these questions originated for me, um, whose narratives come to be preserved and why, and then how does actually seeing and feeling and interacting with physical materials, um, whether that be manuscripts or objects or other aspects of material culture, how does that kind of deepen or alter our understanding of a subject, right, a person, a narrative, um, or sort of a broader culture. Um, and I've increasingly explored these themes in my teaching, particularly this semester um, in my London seminar course, which is called uh, Literary Seance, Communing with Victorian Lives, Texts and Objects. And basically we're thinking in this class about how literature and material artifacts allow us to quote unquote commune with uh, a different sort of era. So um, here we're using visits to museums like the Charles Dickens Museum or the Museum of the London Docklands, um, as well as our own G.K. Chesterton collection to think about how various stories are preserved and presented, um, as well as the kind of absences and silences in the archive, um, which are of course shaped by factors like gender and race and class. So all of these elements of my research and teaching um, and the questions that I've been pursuing there are very much in conversation with my work on Notre Dame's Chesterton related collections, um, which I'm gonna discuss in more detail today. So my focus will be in particular on what these collections reveal, um, not only about their subjects, so in this case, G.K. <laughs> Chesterton, um, but also about sort of other people in their lives, the culture in which they lived, but also their custodians, the collectors, whose dedication or even obsession with their subjects um, have made the preservation of these materials possible. So the briefest of biographical overviews um, for anyone who's not familiar, uh, Gilbert Keith Chesterton was a preeminent writer and thinker of the early 20th century. Um, so he was incredibly prolific as a writer, applying his talents to journalism, fiction, poetry, drama, philosophy, biography, literary criticism, theology, uh, pretty much you name it. And he was also a talented artist and produced illustrations for a number of his works and also an irrepressible doodler, as we'll see um, near the end of my talk today. And Chesterton is, of course, a particular figure of interest for the University of Notre Dame um, for several reasons. So one being that he was a major Catholic thinker um, and lay theologian who famously converted to Catholicism and whose writings have encouraged many people to follow in his footsteps. Um, but also in 1930, sort of at the height of his fame, he visited Notre Dame um, home campus in South Bend and, where he taught two courses on Victorian literature and culture, uh, attended a football game, wrote a poem about it uh, called The Arena, and was awarded an honorary degree. 
So those links go way back and Notre Dame has sort of maintained those links by um, acquiring a significant collection of Chesterton related materials. So the London Global Gateways Chesterton collection, which is fairly recently acquired, um, complements a substantial collection of manuscripts and print materials held at the university's home campus in Indiana, forging this kind of transatlantic connection with Chesterton, which kind of like nicely parallels Chesterton's own um, movement to and from Notre Dame's campus. So this year, as Chesterton's post, as the Chesterton Postdoctoral Fellow, um, I'm helping to sort of process, describe um, the recently acquired uh, collection and draw connections between the sort of US and UK based repositories, um, working with University Archives and South Bend during the fall. So I've sort of already been through their collections in detail. And then um, I'm now diving into the materials here at the London Gateway this semester. So, um, oh, and I should just point out, so these are a couple of materials that are actually held um, at Notre Dame's home campus. So we have a, a great photo of Chesterton and his wife, Francis, arriving in New York, looking fairly solemn about it. Um, and then we also have a cartoon that Chesterton drew for The Juggler, which is a Notre Dame student uh, publication that's actually still ongoing. Um, so he sort of, um, on request did that nice little Victorian doodle <laughs> um, for the publication. So um, I just put together this slide to give you kind of a sense of, of the two main collections that I'm gonna be talking about here. Um, and my, my sort of main question in this first part will be the question of how materials come to be preserved and how archival collections take shape. So in this case, there actually is some pretty strong parallels between uh, the Chesterton collections here in London and in South Bend, uh, both in the types of the materials and the sort of manner of their compilation. So as some of you may know, the um, London-based collection was assembled primarily by Aid Mackey, who is a bookseller and one of the foremost experts, um, is you know, one of the foremost experts on Chesterton. And so um, similarly, much of the collection in South Bend was assembled by John Bennett Shaw, who's known probably most famous as a uh, collector and fan of Sherlock Holmes, uh, but was also an avid Chesterton fan and a Notre Dame alumnus and so donated um, a substantial collection of, of Chesterton materials to the archives there. Um, and so these collections both literally and figuratively bear the mark of their collectors. Um, and you'll see the stamps there uh, that adorn a lot of the materials in those collections. Um, I certainly don't wanna suggest that theirs were the only hands on these collections, um, which have been shaped uh, in many different complex ways, but for convenience, I will kind of refer to them as uh, Shaw's or Mackey's collections. So in this case, uh, the materials that I'm working with have come to be preserved in this particular form because of their collector's interest and dedication and can be um, also particularly kind of interesting and idiosyncratic in that way. So for example, several pieces um, in the London collection bear signs of being created for display or personal enjoyment, um, which is not incompatible with research purposes, um, but, but often presents in a slightly different way. Um, so, for instance, one of the things that I found that I really, really loved uh, was this framed telegram, uh, which was just sort of mixed in with a, a collection of paper materials. Um, and I think it's worth reading the text out because it's so characteristically Chestertonian. Uh, so this was uh, sending his regrets um, for the Johnson Society dinner um, in London. And he says, cannot express my grief and rage at being unable to attend dinner but I'm forbidden by a doctor more despotic than Dr. Johnson. Johnson on his sick bed feared that Burke's conversation would prostrate him. That I wish to heaven I could come and be prostrated by the wit of the Johnson Society, <laughs> Chesterton. So the fact that this was framed indicates a status not just as a token of research interest, but as sort of a relic or a prized possession for display. Um, and similarly, so the John Bennett Shaw collection 
in Notre Dame's home campus, we see a lot of press clippings organized into sort of scrapbook form and what is very clearly um, a work of personal, personal passion and enjoyment that really speaks to how these collections have been kind of shaped by the interests of individuals. And on a related note, um, one of the kind of similarities that was particularly striking to me, perhaps even more so because I was coming to this from a sort of outside perspective and that I'm not a Chesterton scholar, um, is how this collection really, both of these collections give a sense of Chesterton's cultural presence, particularly in print culture, both during his life and after his death. So Chesterton contributed a staggering number of essays and articles to periodical publications such as the Illustrated London News um, and the Bookman, as well as establishing his own periodical, GK's Weekly, and being involved in the edit editorship of several others. And both Shaw and Mackey's collections have very impressive holdings of these contributions, both in their sort of original forms um, when they were originally published in these periodicals, and then also as they were kind of like syndicated or picked up in little extracts and tidbits um, and sort of widely distributed. Um, both of these material, these collections are really meticulous about finding sort of any um, iteration of Chesterton's work that appeared in these periodicals and sort of assembling that all together. So um, looking through these collections makes it much more tangible, not only sort of the volume of what Chesterton was producing, but also more broadly, what kind of the landscape of early 20th century print culture was like. The types of conversations and debates going on that Chesterton and many others were part of. Nor does this sort of systematic um, tabulation of print culture end with Chesterton's death. So for instance, the periodicals kind of section of the um, London-based collection is dated 1901 to 2016 which shows that the original organizers, um, Mackey and perhaps others, basically conceptualize this as kind of an unbroken stream of materials that speak to Chesterton's life and legacy, almost as sort of one unbroken strand, um, and that he sort of maintains a presence in print culture um, up to the present day. Um, and I found it so interesting that they both had just really that, that sense of sort of proliferation and, and broader cultural influence as part of those collections. Um, so this, this is the type of decision in terms of like how these periodicals are organized um, that is really integral to the collection, how they were sort of formed and conceived. And that from an archivist perspective is sort of useful and important to carry forward in our own kind of description and organization of the collection. Um, and we see too, like the sort of legacy of Chesterton's influence and the fact that, for instance, with Mackey's papers, we have papers of him helping folks working on theses about Chesterton and things like that. So this sort of ongoing legacy of, of production and scholarship around Chesterton. Um, so essentially in answer to the kind of hows and whys of preservations in this particular case, um, with these collections, it's very much tied to the dedication and intense interests of particular individual collectors, um, as well as institutions like Notre Dame, whose particular sort of investment in these areas of research um, have made them sort of good stewards for such a collection. So thinking about that, I want to hone in on a couple more um, of the materials themselves and really think about how this speaks to my second guiding question, the how does seeing, feeling, and interacting with physical materials deepen or alter our understanding of a person? Um, so having been in the privileged position of combing through uh, the full GK Chesterton manuscript collection on Notre Dame's home campus, and now having at least laid eyes on most of the manuscript materials here in London, have become intimately familiar with Chesterton's handwritten compositions and particularly his sketches and doodles, which as a doodler myself, although of a much inferior quality, um, I just find infinitely fascinating. Uh, so Chesterton was, as Aidan Mackey put it, um, let me make sure I get this right, yeah, a vandal with books, uh, meaning that he doodled not only in the margins, but often right across the printed text. So we see this in books that he owned, um, which are also part of our collection here in London, 
as well as almost any manuscript material that was written in his hand. So these are often fragmentary drawings. Um, so for instance, you'll see like a tiny little fist, like study of a hand, um, as well as often these side profiles or even just disembodied facial features. Like one time there were like five different noses just sort of floating on a page by themselves. Um, so they're often very sort of fragmentary and sketched out, but the more that I've gone through these collections, it's very clear that these are not typically just kind of idle compositions or random doodles. Um, they're very often drafts of more serious works that Chesterton seemed to have kind of tested out or refined across multiple iterations or perhaps sort of, sort of stuck in his brain and he kept uh, repeatedly drawing them. So I'm not yet to the point of familiarity where I can recall and identify every single one of these connections, except that I repeatedly see faces that look very familiar um, and I can, I can tell that they're all connected. And I, if there's anyone out there, I think that tracking the, the evolution of these specific designs would be an absolutely fascinating research project. So I hope someone um, who has more time than me can do that. Um, so here's a really good example, um, which is from a um, sort of a, a small notebook that has a draft autograph manuscripts of the Five of Swords. Um, this is a short work of fiction. And um, as soon as I saw this drawing in the workbook, I immediately connected it to this other image, which is featured on the, our website right now um, and is actually scribbled across the pages of a Latin uh, primer. And we can see here that he's clearly sort of refining this same figure. I assume it looks very similar uh, across these two different pages. Um, and even, if we look at this other, which I showed earlier, um, it seems to be a similar figure, right? That's uh, in a different position to probably a uh, draft for the same work. Um, so the manuscript and library materials we have often provide an opportunity to sort of see Chesterton's composition process in terms of illustration, um, but also of course, in terms of the written word. So as you may know, he often actually composed by dictating to Dorothy Collins, who was um, his secretary, but also essentially adop an adopted daughter um, for GK and Francis, who were unable to have children of their own. And we have the typewriter on which many of, his, of these works were composed in this manner. Um, but here we can also see at the bottom right, a sort of handwritten edits to a story draft um, and I have a, another sort of cleaner composition here um, for a uh, notes of the week column that appeared in GK's weekly. Um, and we also have quite a few <clears throat> sort of type, typed draft with, um, with Chesterton's handwritten corrections. So together, particularly if we look both across the sort of uh, collections on Notre Dame's home campus, as well as the ones here in London, you can start to develop these really interesting observations about Chesterton's sort of process of composition. And I mean, we can kind of only speculate about the way in which you might've gone back and forth between sort of drawing and writing. Um, but these, these different materials certainly seem to suggest to me a really interesting kind of process oriented approach, thinking about the choices he made, the development of his thoughts. And I find that this kind of process driven insight does generate a real sense of sort of intimacy with the author, um, helping us to envision his literature and literature more generally, not just as a sort of static thing printed on a page, um, but as this sort of process of evolution and decision-making. Um, and I should note that there are of course other avenues towards uh, sort of communing with Chesterton um, in this collection, right? We also have the personal objects like his hats um, or rosary or walking sticks that sort of help bring um, him to life or sort of solidify that real presence in a different way um, for the researcher or, or admirer. So ultimately the ability to access these collections and allow others to make these types of connections is the aim of my work as well as everyone else who's involved in this project. Um, the day-to-day -day kind of nature of my work in London 
is to get a grasp on the materials that we have, sort of organizing them, housing them correctly, describing them so that they will be accessible to researchers and members of the public alike. So through this process, I've gotten to know Chesterton in a fairly unique way. Um, and perhaps because of the nature of my work with the collection, I've come to understand Chesterton as a prolific and uh, wide ranging writer and thinker who left a lasting impression on those who knew him, but also those who study him. And what Notre Dame's Chesterton collections do really well is to kind of preserve his creations and legacy in what I now see as a very appropriately kind of eclectic and wide ranging way, which can present challenges to the archivists uh, to sort of make sense and order out of the whole, um, but it seems completely appropriate to me in terms of capturing the diverse legacies of Chesterton. Um, and I would be remiss not to mention touching on the idea of legacy and influence that these um, connections are not, or the collections are not limited to Chesterton himself. Um, we do also have material related to Dorothy Collins, um, including her diaries, uh, as well as Francis Chesterton, GK's brother, Cecil, and his wife, Ada, who's a fascinating figure, um, as well as materials and correspondence related to the composition of biographies, theses, exhibitions, and all of these sort of proliferations of Chesterton's afterlife. So again, the circle of Chesterton's influence um, and his larger than life presence is very much felt through the collecting and preservation efforts of people like Aidan Mackey, but is also open to, I think, new avenues of exploration and perspectives beyond those of the, the sort of diehard Chesterton devotees. So um, that sums up my remarks. I hope that this has given a kind of nice little um, toe dip into the, the types of materials that we have related to Chesterton. Uh, and I'm happy to answer any questions related to my work uh, in the Q&A. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Trish. And um, that was such a unique perspective. And it is, it's so wonderful because you have become almost the expert on kind of what we have on campus and what we have in, in London. That's it's absolutely amazing to hear. Um, this is an opportunity for me to remind you that we'll be doing a Q&A after both speakers. So if you do have any questions, please put them into the chat box below, um, particularly as they're coming through in your mind after Trish's presentation please put them into the chat box and we'll get to them when we get into our Q&A section. So thank you, Trish. Right, we're now gonna move on to our next speaker this evening, um, Professor Julia Marvin. Professor Marvin is a member of the Programme for Liberal Studies and, the, and at the Medieval Institute. Her research centers on medieval history and literature, particularly on the um, role of the vernacular historical writing in creating late medieval literate, literate English culture. Among her other interests are manuscript studies and medieval multilingualism, which is absolutely fascinating. Um, she is a leading expert on the brute historiographic, I'm sorry, got to put my teeth back in, historiographic tradition in English. Uh, Professor Marvin is currently at work on a full classification and descriptive catalogue of manuscripts of the Anglo-Norman prose brute, an edition and translation of the continuation of the St. Petersburg brute, and the essays on the interpretive influence of the manuscript apparatus, presentation and annotation, which sounds like an absolutely fascinating project. Tonight, Julia will speak on one of her favourite manuscripts of the anglo normal prose, Brute Chronicle, which she used to consider an outliner in the tradition of the medieval vernacular historical writing, and now recognises it as an influential and widespread text because of the evidence of its use in later works. So it is my pleasure to bring Julia to um, the spotlight. So thank you, Julia, and over to you. All right, thank you very much. It may seem as if we're going into completely different territory from G.K. Chesterton, but I think as, as I go, you'll find there are very interesting connections between issues of what we have and what we don't have and how one generates speculation about the other. Okay. In the Middle Ages, people knew that the founder of Britain was a descendant of Aeneas named Brutus who fulfilled a prophecy that he would kill his parents when his mother died in childbirth, as you see at the top, and at the age of 15, when he shot his father in a hunting accident for which he was exiled. 
After a series of Odyssean adventures, Brutus came to this island with his Trojan men. Is my, um, is this blocking my panel of little faces here? There, there we go. After a series of Odyssean adventures, Brutus came to this island with his Trojan men, killed off the giants inhabiting it, which is what you see going on here, and named it Britain after himself. This story was developed and popularized in the 1130s by Geoffrey of Monmouth, who in his Latin Historia Regum Britanniae, or History of the Kings of Britain, provided a full account of British history from the fall of Troy up to the flight of Brutus's descendants, the Britons, from the irresistible power of Saxon invaders. Geoffrey's history includes the first detailed account of the life of King Arthur, which forms the ultimate foundation for every Arthurian tale written ever since. As you can imagine, Geoffrey's history was immediately both popular and controversial. Critical readers then and now accused him of making up most of it. Other writers quickly began to compose verse versions of Geoffrey's narrative in languages that more people could understand. French, which was the vernacular of status in England after the Norman conquest, and English. Such works came to be labeled as brutes because of their typical beginning with the story of Brutus. As time went by, writers added material to bring their accounts closer to their own time so that Galfridian legendary history, as it is sometimes now called, became a vehicle for a great deal of medieval historical writing in England. Around the end of the 13th century, yet another one of these brute histories appeared. It was in prose, in the English dialect of French we call Anglo-Norman, and it used a variety of sources in addition to Geoffrey to create a history of England from Brutus all the way up to 1272, when King Henry III died. This so-called Anglo-Norman prose brute chronicle turned out to be a stunning success. It spawned later versions in French, with additional continuations running into the 14th century, and eventually translations into Middle English that garnered continuations of their own and became a basis for early printed histories of England. Well over 200 manuscripts of prose brutes in Anglo-Norman and Middle English survive, and to medievalists that is a breathtaking number. There are grounds to consider the Prose Brute Chronicle the most popular secular vernacular work of late medieval England. People were still taking its matter seriously and mounting defenses of the Trojan origin story well into the 17th century. As you can imagine, a work in so many versions and manuscripts has a very complicated history, made all the more complicated because only a small fraction of medieval manuscripts have survived. And the prose brute tradition was very neglected in 19th and 20th century scholarship. It wasn't what historians or literary scholars or people in French departments or people in English departments thought of as their territory. When I first began to study it, the only modern edition, which was the Middle English version with no notes, dated from 1908. And the only scholarly book on the topic dated from 1905. So I had a lot of work to do. I ended up focusing on the most neglected part of this neglected field, the Anglo-Norman Prose Brute Chronicle. There are over 50 manuscripts with more still coming to light. Over the years, I have consulted every one of them. Just a couple of weeks ago, I went to Exeter Cathedral Library to examine a recently identified Anglo-Norman Brute extract in a volume of Latin chronicles. That puts me up to date until the next manuscript is discovered. My first major project as a Brute Scholar was to make an edition translation, store study, and commentary for the version of the prose Brute from which all subsequent versions descended. I called this the oldest version, by which I meant the oldest surviving version, to distinguish it from subsequent versions that had acquired confusing nomenclature that fortunately we don't need to deal with today. This job, of course, entailed identifying all the manuscripts of the oldest version, comparing them, deciding which manuscript to use as my basic text, and then noting every variant, every moment when another manuscript differed substantially from it. I ended up with five 14th century manuscripts to compare. Now, let me show you what I mean by variants and how they help you think 
about relationships among manuscripts of the same work. Suppose you had as your base text, a manuscript containing this sentence, and you found other manuscripts containing these slightly different versions of the same sentence. What you would end up with for variance is something like this, in which each difference between the original text, the text that you've chosen as the normative one, and the other texts is represented. Some differences may look significant, but aren't significant. Bill and Will are uh, variations of the same name, and you cannot really tell anything about the relationship between manuscripts on that basis. Something like the nature of the sandwich in question gives you a lot more to go on. Um, you can see that it would be very difficult to get back from just sandwich, the version of manuscript C there, to all the way to peanut butter and jelly. But what about the tasty added in manuscript B? Might be important, might not. And finally, in manuscript C, uh, we have a whole additional phrase there. Could that be important? If you found it in a lot of manuscripts, it would tell you something about what was going on. But it could also be a one-off contribution by a scribe sharing his opinion on the combination of peanut butter sandwich and squid. We can come back to these examples later if anyone is interested in the kinds of puzzles it presents. As I worked on the Prose Brood edition, one manuscript came to stand out from the other four, and that's the one I'm going to consider today, Oxford Bodleian Manuscript Wood Empt 8, which from here on I'll just call Wood. It was a very likable manuscript, carefully prepared, and easier to read than many, just to give you a side-by-side -side example of the Wood manuscript and a considerably less tidy one. But its content didn't match up as closely to the other manuscripts in two different ways. As I ended up saying in my introduction to the edition, the text of the brood is meticulously given with few careless errors. In a number of places, W or Wood more closely resembles the sources of the oldest version than do the other manuscripts. It may be that W represents the earliest surviving state of the text, However, the text also shows evidence throughout of editing for clarity and concision of style, and in, for instance, supplying proper names when an antecedent is unclear. Because of the signs of minor revision, because of the presence of the beginning of a continuation, W cannot be considered a pure text of the oldest version, and I have not chosen it as base text, despite its many good qualities. I did include the Woods manuscript variants in the edition. Thinking of it as a text that might shed some light on the history of the Chronicle before the oldest surviving version, and also as an interesting isolated case, a stump on the huge family tree of brood texts. I call this the Wood version of the prose brood. Now this version turns out to have some relatives after all, and they make for an interesting story. First, I have identified another manuscript with the same version of the Chronicle, so the Wood Manuscript is no longer alone in the world. This manuscript is St. Petersburg National Library of Russia, French Q548. Back in 1989, the library had listed it in its typewritten catalog as a likely prose brood, but the skimpy and somewhat misleading information publicly available about it meant that until I was able to see the real thing, I wasn't in a position to adequately analyze it. I was finally able to visit the National Library of Russia in 2017, and it's a good thing I did because I doubt I'm ever going back. It is a fascinating volume containing not only a main text closely related to the Wood version, but other revealing and novel material that I don't have time to go into today. Andy King of the University of Southampton and I Art work on an edition of translation and commentary for it, so there will be more to say in due course. What's interesting for our purposes today, and for your glimpse of the exciting life of a manuscript scholar, is that neither the Wood manuscript nor the NLR manuscript can be directly exclusively based on the other. That is, there must have existed at least one, and probably more than one, other manuscript of this version or we can't account for the differences between the two texts. How can we tell this? Sometimes 
you can tell that one manuscript couldn't have been copied from another just because of their ages. Something that was copied in the 15th century, let's suppose we can tell because of a date in the manuscript or because something definitive in the style of the handwriting, that manuscript obviously cannot be the source from which a 14th century manuscript was copied. But manuscript genetics are a funny thing. Those two manuscripts might be far apart in age, but still very closely related. In fact, sisters, if they are both copied from the same 13th century manuscript. However, our two manuscripts today don't have clear-cut differences in age. They don't have any information telling when they were copied, and although their handwriting is visibly different, both are typical of the mid-14th century, so they don't firmly tell us which book is older. We have to judge based on the content of the text. Here's another set of hypothetical examples. You can see that these are versions of the same, the same sentence, but sentences B and C could derive from A, which contains everything in B and C, but A could not possibly derive from B or C because they lack what it has. Obviously, the more cases there are in a manuscript to compare and the more distinctive the text involved is, the stronger the conclusions you can draw. Here's a case in which each of these two versions, let's say we only have two, has text that the other lacks and lacks text that the other has. So they can't be direct exclusive sources from one another. Here we have to hypothesize that another text with all of these names in the list appears to have existed. And it is indeed at times like this, long lists of names, uh, complicated dates or figures that you find telling differences that you can track through different groups of manuscripts. So it's on the basis of differences like these that I concluded that neither of these manuscripts could be copied from the other, and additional evidence indicates that they were also likely not to be copied from the same now lost manuscript. So now we're up to five, or sorry, four manuscripts of this odd text. Once the edition of the oldest version of the Anglo-Norman prose brut was in print in 2006, other scholars were in a position to consult the text and variants in their own research. Now this version, the wood version of the brood, has been identified by Marie Potts and Eric Koper as a source for Middle English poem on the life of Arthur, which appears in the middle of a Latin chronicle contained in the delightfully named Red Book of Bath, Longleat House, Manuscript 55. And Gerd de Wilde and Heather Pagan have identified the Anglo-Norman continuation to Geoffrey of Monmouth found in Cambridge University Library Manuscript DD 1032 as being abridged and adapted from the Wood version, which means, speaking of weird genetics, that a distant descendant of Geoffrey containing completely different material has been grafted directly back onto its ultimate ancestor. Once again, the textual evidence shows that neither of the surviving manuscripts of the Wood version can be direct sources for this Cambridge manuscript, which suggests yet another lost manuscript to add to the roster. And it also provides more evidence of the geographical distribution of the Wood version and of its interest to writers working in a variety of genres and languages. I should mention that the more mainstream oldest version, or brutes derived from it, has now also been recognized as an important source for other works of late medieval history. This isn't a phenomenon relating only to the version I'm talking about today. When I was working on the edition and began to realize how distinctive the Wood Manuscript was, I wondered if I ought to include it or leave it out as two different texts. Now I am very glad that I kept it in because its presence in the variants has made it possible for scholars to notice its existence and distinctiveness and begin to trace its influence, which otherwise would not have happened until someone else produced a full edition of it. Reading manuscripts is a lot of fun and it's very important, but modern print editions are still indispensable resources. So, the Wood manuscript that looked like an idiosyncratic one-off turns out to be no such thing. And a lot of what we can figure out about the circulation and influence of this version of the Chronicle comes from scrutinizing the tiniest details of the surviving evidence 
in order to develop a sense of what has been lost. This is a reminder that the patterns of what has survived may be more haphazard and less representative than it's easy to assume. And this may especially be the case with the anglo norman prose brood tradition. Its manuscripts tend to be relatively cheap rather than treasured luxury objects. Its texts became less useful as its language became more and more obsolete. And its content also became obsolete as updated versions began to appear in English and eventually in print. Many of these manuscripts were probably destroyed when their parchment became more valuable as raw material for reuse. This makes it all the more important to mine the surviving evidence as deeply and rigorously as we can. I hope that, aside from learning things about a manuscript you will probably never need to think about again, you've gotten some sense of how active medieval scribal culture was. For texts like the Bible or Church Fathers, scribes may have felt obligated to copy their sources exactly as possible. But in er other areas, they extensively brought to bear their own knowledge and creativity to make ever new texts. I hope you've also gotten a sense of what medieval manuscript scholars do as they try to put together all kinds of puzzles, figuring out the shape of the missing pieces on the basis of the pieces that survive. So thank you very much for taking the time to join us this afternoon. Thank you so much, Julia. That was absolutely fascinating, uh, particularly as a classicist, hearing um, the reception of Troy was really interesting. So I might end up talking to you a bit about that in a second, but thank you so, so much. Um, absolutely fascinating. Um, right, this is the moment where we kind of open the floor up to questions. So please, um, there's a chat box at the bottom. So if you do have any questions for Trish or Julia, this is the time to start populating that chat box. We'll go through those questions um, and see how many we can get through. Um, I would like to ask, actually, I've got, I've got two questions. Can we bring Trish back up on the screen as well, perhaps? Wonderful, excellent. Um, both of you actually did kind of talk about your topics of research and, 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 and in a way, Trish talks about how she's using what she does in the classroom. And Julie, you were educating us as if we were in the classroom, I felt, with the, the manuscript and the um, variants. How, how often do you feel that um, when you are teaching, it's so important to go back to those primary source materials to emphasize what you're talking about and and the roots and, and almost playing detective um with these materials um do you emphasize that in um, that your research emphasizes that to the students or um vice versa um maybe i'll ask trish to go first with that yeah sure thanks charlotte um so definitely i think since i started working with manuscripts i much more feel like my students also need need to um, have a sense of, of what that looks like. Um, probably the, the best example um, of, of when it can be really transformative. Um, last semester I taught the, and I will actually in a couple of weeks um, teach it here, uh, the Diaries of Anne Lister, um, who was yeah late, uh, late 18th, early 19th century um, lesbian, sort of actually defined herself, not with that word, but um, essentially someone who a woman who only loved other women and she she kept her diaries um extensive parts of her diaries in code um to sort of record the more sensitive bits of her narrative um and so I actually have students uh sort of decode like look at a key and sort of decode that um to to give them I mean in part because it's just kind of fun but also I think it gives them a sense of the sort of archival labor, um, particularly with sources that were never published uh, in printed form in their sort of original state. So I think that having students engage in that kind of thinking just A, provides them a window into what, what it is that scholars do, um, but also, again, gives them a sense of, of what these texts are really like. And the, again, the sort of fact that they're not totally static, um, that there's always that process of sort of composition and mediation that goes into delivering them in their sort of handy printed form that they usually get in the classroom. And how about you, Julia? Yeah. 
Well, since my my long-term position is in a great books program, I've essentially devoted my life to primary texts. One trade-off of that is that I don't very often actually get to teach my research to undergraduates. And one of the very nice things about being here in London this semester is that I have actually been able to incorporate a lot of this legendary history and even these prose brute texts in particular um, in a course that's essentially about material culture, how people use objects around them to generate um, historical narrative or conversely how they um, see the objects around them and, or have narratives and make uh, ex post facto explanations for the objects around them based on those narratives. And we've had a lot of chance just walking around London and visiting places like Stonehenge uh, to see how dynamic that relationship between texts and objects and um, memory and, and narrative are. Yeah. Wonderful. Oh, it's great when you can actually bring your research into the classroom and, and see the passion in the students' eyes when they start to realise that it's actually they can uncover and play detective. I think it's a fabulous opportunity. Um, we actually do have a question for Julia, um, and it kind of bounces off what Trish was talking about. So Trish was speaking to the specific value that the physical artefacts have in her research. Julia, in your research with these manuscripts, have they helped or hindered, uh, been hindered by digital copies? So what's the importance of kind of seeing it actually in person versus having it as a digital copy? Mm -hmm. Well, digitization is on the whole a, a truly, truly wonderful thing. Um, and I remember back in the day when I could get a black and white photocopy of a microfilm, I thought I was in heaven. Um, so, so now to have full colored, uh, very, very fine digital reproductions, uh, sometimes even available for free, is, uh, is a tremendous thing. It does not replace um, seeing manuscripts in, in person in part because these texts are three-dimensional objects. And uh, you would not believe the number of uh, artifacts that appear on, on a digital page that are a result of the lighting under which they were taken, of color differences between exposures, of holes in the page that you can't see that are showing text through from the, through from the other side. Um, so they're they're wonderful, but they they are in in no way replacements for the for the the real objects themselves. Certainly, how have you found that with that Trish? Because you, you've sometimes dealt with digital items as well, haven't you? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's you know most most of the time I relied on on digital artifacts. It's sort of the privilege of being in some place like London is that then you actually get to go uh, look at things, and I think. Yeah, I think the sort of um, the more dynamic and interactive experience. So if you're at an archive or you're in a museum or, you know, I, I sort of, you know, brought my students to look at the Chesterton stuff and they can just kind of see what a collection is and how all of these things fit together. Um, you know, I sometimes there are other sort of the opportunity for other kind of sensory experience or at least you're sort of navigating space in a different way. I think a lot of it is very hard to sort of quantify or put your finger on what is special um, about actually seeing, you know, there's just the sort of aura factor, um, which I don't know, students may or may not appreciate to the level that I do. Um, but yeah, I think there is absolutely something about it and, and something worth doing that I agree that sort of digitization is, is essential for making that kind of those sort of things accessible, but there's always going to be the sort of X factor um, when you get to, to work with something in person. Wonderful, thank you. Um, just a reminder for our audience, you can be throwing in questions into the chat or sending us direct messages with questions, but please, yeah, um, get your questions in. We have another question um, about, back to Trish, about the Chesterton collection. Um, with the collection, you, you, obviously you're not a Chestertonian scholar yourself. Um, how do you feel that's kind of helped you or hindered you in some ways engaging with these um, two kind of locations of rich Chesterton materials? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I mean, I, I definitely do think I don't know if it, it hinders me. I feel like if I had the 
the knowledge of all Chesterton outputs in, in my brain, I would be even more sort of attuned to these kind of connections. Um, it's been a really rewarding process. And I'm like, ah, I recognize that. Or I see, you know, oh, I see a parallel between uh, this other thing. But um, I do think sort of it has been very valuable for me sort of coming at it with, with totally fresh eyes. Um, because I think a lot of people, they sort of have a very defined entry point into Chesterton, right? Like, they were readers of Father Brown, or they're like really interested in his more theological works, or you know, there's there's a thing that they associate with Chesterton, and that's likely to be their primary sort of lens for reading him. And sort of as I said a couple of times during my talk, he is such like a wide ranging um, and multifaceted figure that I think sort of coming to it um, without a lot of preconceived notions or sense of like what the best angle to view Chesterton from is, um, has really allowed me to sort of have a, a really strong appreciation uh, just for that diversity and has allowed me to really just enjoy the process of, of diving into these collections and seeing what's there. Wonderful. And, and um, you mentioned there's a lot of female voices that are within the archives. Is that going to be kind of semi-connected to your research? Because obviously you have done gender studies yourself. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly, it's something that I'm always sort of interested in or looking for. Um, for instance, uh, yeah, so I, I didn't know um, about Ada Chesterton, whose maiden name I can't remember right now, but she, I mean, um, she was a fascinating figure who, you know, um, like went and stayed in whatever the early 20th century equivalent of workhouses <laughs> would be uh, and, and sort of, um, yeah, it was this really bold figure. And then of course, I'm, I'm very interested in Dorothy Collins because she is very much integral to the process of composition as I was talking about a little bit with her sort of literally typing up the works, um, but is often invisible in many of the documents in the archive. Um, so I'm, I'm excited to look into um, some of the materials that the London Gateway has, uh, as I was saying, we, we have her actual diaries and we have some of her papers um, and things like that. So I'm, yeah, that's something I'm, I'm excited to explore more about. But yeah, I'm always sort of attuned to those like peripheral or almost hidden um, presence of female voices, um, which is, is often how they come into the collection, which is obviously centered on Chesterton <laughs> um, and uh, so yeah it's it's been it's been really fascinating and I have a long list of things that I want to do follow-up <laughs> inquiries on related to that. Wonderful thank you Trish and then our final question for Julia um, so we have a uh, the question is the example that you mentioned about men being killed in battle um, you explained how different versions A, B, C can be related. A is the parent text, B and C could be derived from A, but not each other. Can you explain why A could not be derivative of both B and C as it in a combinatory text? So uh, it sounds like I'm giving you a, a mathematical equation, doesn't it? Um, so can you explain why A could not be a derivative of both B and C? Oh, I see. So yeah. someone has both B and C on his on his desk and combines the two of them. Um, it's mathematically possible, and we do occasionally see um, some signs of that sort of editorial activity. Um, that's something that we're getting more and more evidence for as this kind of myth of the lone copyist dully copying out um, one, you know, one manuscript and turning over two pages at once and never even noticing. Um, as, as the kind of model of work, what you would want to what you would want to be testing over the course of an, of looking at manuscripts would be whether you would see things that could represent that kind of activity over and over and over again. Um, so it is possible, but you need some good strong evidence not to just go with the simplest hypothesis in in the first place. Yeah. No. And as you can imagine, I mean, if you look at an edition of one of these texts, the variants go on for you know, hundreds of pages uh, for, for exactly that reason. And it is, it is a lot harder than it looks to derive meaning from them. It is, it's not a mechanical process at all. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it sounds absolutely fascinating. I no doubt I'm going to catch up with you both at some point and we're going to do deep dive into um, the topics you talked about today. But thank you so much for giving us your um, 
wonderful insights into your research topics. And um, thank you to everyone who's here in attendance. Um, hopefully you've enjoyed today's event and will consider joining us for our future and subsequent seminars, um, which also prove uh, are providing us with some very insightful and engaging topics. Our next seminar will take place on Wednesday, the 16th of March. It will feature feature our first kind of collaboration across global gateways. We're going to have Lisa Caulfield, who's based in our Kyle Moore Abbey Global Centre, and um, Faye Stevens, who teaches in the London Global Gateway. Um, they will be discussing sustainability and sacred water. Um, so that's really exciting. If you haven't signed up, please sign up. As to attendees here today, you will be among the first to receive further information on these upcoming gatherings. So we hope that you and anyone you choose to share this information with, please share this information with, and um, will be able to join us. And so thank you again to our speakers, virtual round of applause, and thank you again for joining us. Good evening.